Okay, everybody, let's get started. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Lisa Johnson, and on behalf of Everbridge, we are excited to present this webinar, Active Shooter to MCI Healthcare Communication Frameworks for Emergency Preparedness and Response. Our experts today are Francine Sneddon and Marjorie Smallwood. They both work in emergency and continuity management for the University of California, San Francisco. Before our agenda today, we'll go over a few logistics. We'll have some speaker introductions. Then we'll get into the meat of the presentation with Marjorie and Francine. At the end of their presentation, they'll be going over some case studies, including Ebola, um, moving multiple patients and dealing with floods in a hospital. There'll be some wrap-up discussions and then we'll do our Q&A. Okay, but let's talk about our speakers. So we're going to start with Francine. Francine is the IT Service Continuity Manager for the University of California, San Francisco. Francine has worked nearly 10 years at UCSF and manages the IT Service Continuity Management process. She is responsible for conducting business impact analysis for IT applications implementing IT disaster recovery strategies, facilitating the IT Department Operations Center program, and exercises and managing the Everbridge Emergency Notification System. Marjorie joined the University of California system in 2011 as the Business Continuity and Emergency Management Planner for UCLA Health. Working collaboratively with the Los Angeles County Emergency Services Agency, she developed business continuity and emergency planning resources for clinics and hospitals affiliated with the Hospital Preparedness Program. Prior to joining the UC system, Marjorie was the emergency manager for the Loma Linda Center for Public Health Preparedness. She now serves as the emergency and continuity manager for UCSF Medical Center. Marjorie holds a master's in public health from Loma Linda University with a concentration in global health and emergency preparedness and is a certified healthcare emergency professional. So we're going to start uh, the full presentation. Marjorie, we're going to hand it over to you. Well, hello. Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. So as you can see on our screen, Lisa, thank you for that phenomenal introduction. Um, we'll be talking about active shooter to MCI, so healthcare communication frameworks for emergency preparedness and response. I'm going to share some lessons learned from how our organization has been working to utilize the EveryBridge platform to enhance our emergency communications at UCSF Medical Center. So once again, welcome everybody. Um, just to give an overview of what we'll be speaking to recap what Lisa mentioned a little bit earlier, um, we'll give an overview of our organization, who we are, what UCSF Medical Center represents, um, and we'll talk about our notification selection process. So how we came to identify the need to have a target notification system for our organization and the steps we took to implement that process. We'll also speak to backup strategies when primary systems fail um, and our system management framework. So once we got the system in place, how are we going to manage that sustainably? Um, and lessons learned in that process as we've had the system for about a year and a half now. So who we are. Um, as some of you may know, uh, this is actually our newest uh, facility. This is our Mission Bay campus. This is UCSF Medical Center at Mission Bay. Um, this is our, our new hospital that we've opened up. It's actually a hospital complex on Mission Bay, our campus here. We have our UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital, um, which is 183 beds um, that serves all pediatric specialties. Um, in this complex, we also have our UCSF Bacar Cancer uh, Hospital that has 70 adult beds that serves patients with ortho, uro, gyno, head and neck, and other GI cancers. And we also have our UCSF Betty Irene Moore Women's Hospital that has a 36-bed birth center in the facility. And at the tail end of our organization to the far left, you can see our Gateway Medical Building, um, which has numerous um, you know, ancillary services and also outpatient services that we provide for the community. Second to that, this is actually our original campus, um, what we were first known for, Parnassus, so UCSF Medical Center at Parnassus. It's our original hospital. Um, the location, the campus, is over 100 years old, with the hospital being about 50 years old. It's a 15-story facility um, with a little over 600 adult beds, um, and we also have adjacent to the hospital campus our ambulatory care center, which offers numerous outpatient um, services at that location, and then to the far left, once again, our Langley Porter Psychiatric Institute. So our third primary campus for the medical center is UCSF Medical Center at Mount Zion. 
Um, and this is home to a hub of specialized clinics and services. We have in, the, um, in that uh, hospital environment a 90-bed surgery center with 10 operating rooms, um, numerous outpatient clinics adjacent to the facility, um, and we also have our OSHER Center for Integrative Medicine near that campus, um, which offers numerous alternative therapies. And inside that building, which is pictured here, we also have our Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center. Um, and then adjacent to that, our Center for Excellence in Women's Health. So as you can see, um, these are our primary three campus sites for the medical center um, with numerous servers, services offered at each. And we are triangulated across the city and county of San Francisco. So as you can see with this map here, um, we have our UCSF Mount Zion campus, which is um, north closer to our Lower Pacific Heights region. We have our UCSF Mission Bay, um, which is not too far from the downtown San Francisco area. And then we have up, up on the hill, we have our original UCSF Parnassus Adult Hospital. So let's talk math, UCSF by the numbers. So annually we have about 770,000 outpatient visits for our facilities, um, including 38,000 hospital admissions for our primary hospital sites and over 10,000 staff that support the medical center organization. We also have, in addition to these three primary campus sites that you saw, over 200 plus outpatient locations spread throughout the city and San Francisco area um, and across the Bay and actually serving the Central Valley region for California. Um, so we have a wide scope of services and a, a wide scope of practice across the Central and Northern California region for UCSF Medical Center. And one final note, you know, I forgot to mention uh, the fun tip on, we have about 1,800 babies that we have born annually at our UCSF location. So with that, you saw the wide scope of our organization. We are a solid team of three. <laughs> this is our Department of Emergency Management. You can see I'm to the right, I'm the Emergency and Continuity Manager for UCSF. Listed in the middle, that's my director, Joe Vu. He's our Director of Emergency Management for the Medical Center. And then to my far left, my colleague, Jordan Cathy. That's our Trainings and Exercise Manager for the organization. Um, so we'll talk about some of our team's efforts to enhance emergency communications pre um, uh, preparedness for our organization. So here's the story. Let's talk about why we actually had some initial idea of needing a notification platform. Um, so when I came on board um, to UCSF specifically, um, not too long in, in 2014, um, we had a number of events impact us. Uh, one of the primary ones that actually hit us a lot harder than we had expected um, was the Pineapple Express storm. As you can see, some people think of the Pineapple Express movie. I'm, I'm talking about the storm that hit um, the West Coast in, in late 2014. Um, and that actually hit us harder than the last El Nino season. So with the Pineapple Express, we had some pretty significant flooding on our transportation routes, our highways. Um, and that impacts, as you know, any healthcare organization with regards to discharges, um, you know, facility transports, and staff being able to get to your organization. Um, so we needed to be able to send out some communications to those groups so that we could apprise them of hospital operations. However, at this time, um, we had a notification system that was sort of a backup system that came as an add-on um, platform with one of our primary IT systems. So it wasn't something that was consistently used. We had no idea how the data was really, um, how employee contact information, I should say, was input into that system. Um, and when I logged in to use it, it really wasn't a, a user-friendly interface. So. Um, with that event, we did our best. We sent information out with the system with what we had at the time, but we realized we needed something more. We needed something stronger that we could manage more efficiently. Um, another incident around that time frame, not too much longer, not too much later, I should say, um, is actually uh, the, um, sorry, that should be in early 2015 and fall of 2014, the Ebola preparations, as many of you have experienced for yourselves, that, that came through quickly with our organizations and we needed to ramp up preparations very expediently. So with that, um, it was a very collaborative initiative for our organization, not only working with you know, a number of interdepartments um, for um, clinical and non-clinical services, but also with our city and county partners. Um, so we needed to be able to have a communication platform that would service not only our internal departments, but be able to send information to our city, uh, our city partners for this initiative. 
Um, we also had a number of response teams tied to our wall of preparations as well, clinical and non-clinical, so we needed to reach all of them, but not everybody was on pager. So we didn't have one centralized platform or method in order to send out these communications to these groups. So we identified clearly that we needed something stronger. We had disparate communication modalities. You know, we have a really solid overhead paging system throughout our environments, but as you all know, there are the dreadful dark zones. Um, somebody can be in an office or in a stairwell at certain locations, um, particularly our older facilities, and may not hear clearly the overhead communications. Um, there's also various cell phone modalities, desktop phones. Um, and we really didn't have a centralized mm -hmm. platform to be able to send out communications to our phones, our pagers, um, via text messaging, et cetera. So that's where we realized we needed to change. We need a stronger platform for emergency notifications. In addition, we needed to make sure that that platform still helped us maintain our regulatory requirements at a minimum for our foundation for planning. Um, as you all know, these emergency managers will recognize our Joint Commission compliance requirements for emergency communications, making sure we have solid methods and resources to send notifications not only to our staff but to our patients and visitors um, and to those that service the organization, and having backup systems and resources and processes in place if those primary systems fail. So I'll hand it over to my colleague, Francine, who will jump on in on how we selected the EverBridge system. And before we get started, um, I believe Lisa will start our poll. Okay, so we have uh, two polls in today's webinar. The first one is, what is your healthcare organization's primary method of sending emergency communications to staff? So do you use desktop phones, email, pagers, VoIP, or cell phones? And so we're asking for your primary method um, that you use right now. And uh, Marjorie or Francine, do you want to talk to that about what you guys do at UCSF? Sure. Um, our uh, main method is we try to fit all the IP-based um, modalities first, as that seems to be the quickest method to reach people. So IP-based would be um, cell text messages, SMS, um, email, mobile member app. And I am getting ready to close this. Um, we'll hold it open for a few more seconds. So if you have an opinion, tell us now. <laughs> and OK, closing it. There we go. So the results are primarily email and mobile. Let's go back to the webinar. Okay, Francine, all yours. Great, thank you, Lisa. Hi, good morning or good afternoon. Marjorie has done an excellent job of implementing our emergency notification process here at the CSF Medical Center. In support of our process, I assisted her team and ours with selecting a new notification tool. To guide us in our notification tool selection process, we reviewed the Gartner Magic Quadrant. The Magic Quadrant is a research report put out by Gartner that shows who the competing players are in the major technology market. At the time of the report, there were 50 vendors in the emergency mass notification space. The Magic Quadrant focused on enterprise-level offerings and ranked 11 of the most competitive vendors in the U.S. Everbridge was listed high in the leader quadrant with the ability to execute and the completeness of vision. We also conducted workshops to gather our stakeholder requirements. Our stakeholder groups included emergency management, medical center security, our IT service desk, and our team IT service continuity. In addition, we reached out to our contacts at sister UC organizations to gather feedback regarding the emergency notification systems they were using and asked what features they liked or didn't like. Here is a partial list of the questions we reviewed and scored during our workshop meetings. As you can see here in the second column, we prioritized as a group our high must-haves to low wish list items. We looked at certifications, compliance, data center configuration, resiliency, available protocols. We also requested documentation regarding IT service management processes like service level agreements, customer support docs, overall support and cost. Once we, we, we completed our requirements, we provide, provided this list of questions for vendors to answer during the request for purchase or RFP process. Based on the responses we received, we selected three vendors to provide a demo. 
During the demo, we asked for vendors to demonstrate our specific user stories and individually score the results. Vendors could notice how CSIS could update their personal record information, how data feed information was populated, and more. Please feel welcome at the end to email me notify like a tool this list, and I'd be happy to share it with Gartner Magic Quad. And no surprise here, Evan Bridge was the winner. Um, the next partner slide was a bit competing to go over our IT configuration with a few tips we have. We also have a nightly data feed from our human resources system for, to Everbridge. Due to the restrictions of our employee labor and relations department, we were only allowed to pull in work contact information. All personal contact modalities like home phone or cell phone could only be provided via an opt-in process. And however perfect our emergency notifications are structured in Everbridge, our success is largely dependent on how good our data is. To help ensure employee information was updated at the source, our HR system, we provided a self-service directory that allowed employees to update their contact information. Another important note, to ensure you're facilitating the best customer experience for your users, make sure your member portal does not allow your users to update any information that is coming in from your data feeds. Since UCSF pulls work contact data from our HR system, we want our users to update their records directly at the source using our self-service directory. Can you imagine the frustration a user might feel if they updated their information on the member portal, only to have it overwritten the next day by our data feed? They would not like us very much. And my final tip is regarding email. Be sure to meet with your internal subject matter experts to ensure your Everbridge notifications will not bring down your email system. Everbridge was added to our safe senders list to ensure notifications would not hit the spam folder and also to influence the order by which Everbridge notifications were processed and received by our email system. Everbridge emails were designated with high importance in our email priority queue. And at this point, um, I'd like to turn it over to Lisa to start another poll. Hello, everybody. Okay, so coming out with our next poll, and you can start voting right away. Um, when your emergency notifications include a response or polling question, from which contact modality have you seen the best response? So let us know. Um, right now, texting is winning in a landslide. <laughs> um, and Francine or Marjorie, do you have any comments on this and how you guys operate? Definitely text is one of our favorite uh, methods just because it's IP based and everyone usually carries a cell phone. Same. And to jump onto that, we have learned through testing and sending out our notifications that our staff prefer receiving that notification, notification via a text um, as opposed to the phone call, the automated phone call that can be sent via Everbridge. 
Okay, and uh, we're going to close the poll in just a second. Hang on, I'll share it with everyone. There we go. So text, oh my god, very overwhelmingly the best way to go. So that's interesting. <laughs> okay, turning it back over to you guys. Okay, and please feel free to continue. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, Lisa, and thanks, Francine, for that excellent IT overview. Um, just to reiterate, Francine was dead on. Our system is only good as the data. Um, and so with that, every year during National Preparedness Month in September, we run a campaign to advocate a number of preparedness initiatives for our organization, but also to remind folks to log in via our self-service directory to make sure that their employee contact information is up to date. Um, so, you know, if they've changed their work cell phone, um, if they've moved office locations, they can input the correct information, and it goes back to our human, res our human resources database. So that's a great initiative there. Um, and as you can see from this strange model pictured <laughs> in the presentation, um, I was exceptionally giddy when we saw that Everbridge um, not only met but surpassed our criteria, our criteria for a targeted notification platform. Um, it allowed us one centralized location to be able to manage our communications to send to those various disparities that were listed. Um, it had backup procedures, and, and Francine and working with Everbridge was able to solidify those and to make sure that we had those implemented for our organization. Um, and from an administrator's perspective, it was very user-friendly. And I'll speak to how we administer those, those messaging templates in the near future. So one, um, we're going to look at the steps now to how we really had process management for utilizing the system for our emergency communications. So we. We're able to get the tool, implement this, we have it set up, but now we needed to look at, okay, how are we going to manage the system ongoing? Um, so we made sure that we didn't have necessarily one person doing everything as a potential single point of failure. Um, we had a collaborative approach to managing emergency communications to our organization. Um, so our team met um, with a number of various departments that are very engaged in our emergency, command, our emergency management committee um, and are very engaged in our emergency response efforts for the organization, such as um, the great leadership we have from security services and from uh, facility services and then our safety officer. So through our interdepartmental meetings um, with also clinical and non-clinical staff, um, we identified um, different components that we wanted for the activation process. Um, and we were also able to discuss um, what we needed and what our leadership was looking for in having a system for our organization and how they wanted that facilitated. Um, and then deciding on our administrative support and processes, how we wanted to roll that out and manage it ongoing. This included really reassessing our emergency communications as they tie to our culture of emergency management for UCSF. Uh, from a mitigation perspective, we wanted to make sure that the system we had redundant communication resources if the primary platform went down, um, and we had pre-addressed and, and identified any potential outage issues and backup procedures there. And from a preparedness perspective, making sure that from our hazard and vulnerability annual assessment, and we looked at those primary hazards we're vulnerable to and different messaging that we may need to send for emergencies that might impact our organization. I wanted to make sure we also streamlined messaging templates so they were appropriate for these types of events. So that when we had to go into the response phase, it was as short as possible. We wanted to make sure we had clear activation and notification protocols with those targeting messages templates so they were able to be received to those target teams, staff, or the locations um, necessary for the response and recovery efforts so that we could maintain effective situational awareness and potentially decrease the length of response and recovery through strategic messaging to make sure our staff were well apprised of how we were managing the incident. So also step two, from a process management perspective, we needed a solid activation framework. We needed to know exactly who would be authorized to activate for our emergency alerts. And just to um, set some precedent here for those folks on the line, for other healthcare organizations, hospitals, UCSF has um, uh, a number of hospitals under our belt with two primary EDs, emergency departments. Um, we have our emergency department at Parnassus, mm -hmm. um, and we also have our emergency department at Mission Bay, which is predominantly pediatrics as it's in our children's hospital. Um, so we plan accordingly with our city and county protocols for MCI mass surge planning. Um, and we are not a trauma center, but we make sure um, that we are able to receive patients when there's an MCI event. So with that, we tied in not only our internal protocols, but made sure they 
you know, um, were effective and in line with those set by our city and county EMS and public health partners so that we knew how to activate when something occurred in the city and county. Um, it was a collaborative initiative internally, um, making sure that that leadership, um, you know, were pleased with the process um, and then thought the protocols were very streamlined for ease of use. Um, and I must give extreme kudos to our facilities director. Those folks are spot on. Um, they respond to a number of utility issues all the time, and, and they just have a phenomenal efficiency with their communications and give some great insight in helping us develop this event notification architecture, um, making sure that we knew who we would call, how we would confer with the administrator on call and the hospital supervisor to confirm whether or not we needed to activate or whether we needed to just stand by and see um, how the event progresses. And if they did give the approval for activating from our administrator on call, that would go to our security services department, which is phenomenal, is there and available 24 by 7, and is a point resource for sending those notifications. So we didn't have one single point of failure if an incident happened at 2 a.m. and maybe somebody didn't receive their email or wasn't monitoring their phone. So we made sure that it was sustainable with 24-7 resources that could send a notification at the drop of a hat. Step three, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we really needed a clear messaging strategy. Um, we needed to know what we were sending out and how we could make it as effective as possible to our staff and our responder teams engaged in the emergency response efforts. So with that, as I mentioned a little bit before, we wanted to align our messaging templates with those utilized by our, our city and county partners with emergency management um, to have very concise messaging scripts that cover our phases through the response so folks would know when to stand by or activate for an incident that may have occurred. And we would send consistent situation status reports, as you can see there. And then lastly, the happy all clear. <laughs> so we wanted to make sure we covered all of our phases. And in the language written in the templates, the information there is basic. It does not use acronyms. We always know in emergency management to use plain speak um, and to send something that's very simple because you know, um, emotions can be high in these types of environments. They're very stressful situations. So we try to keep it as basic as necessary with only vital information. And lastly, for step four, testing and utilization. So for us, um, there were a number of series, there were a number of events that really helped us start to beta test the process, beta test the system, um, and then jump into full uh, active alerts, um, which Lisa mentioned a little bit earlier on, and I'll show right now is some case studies. For the first one being our operation move. So um, that was one of the greatest opportunities I've had the um, you know, option to be a part of. And I just, the organization performed phenomenally well with our city and county partners. Um, that was our transition to open the Mission Bay campus. Um, and as you saw in some of the images earlier on, that was a 10-year process, a 10-year planning process. And on February 1st, they transported over 131 patients across the city and county of San Francisco um, to our new facilities, and we decommissioned our Mount Zion campus from being an inpatient hospital to now being an outpatient surgery center and location for a number of other outpatient services. Within that process for Operation MOVE, we also had over 40 ambulance rigs participating and supporting through local EMS and um, AMR partners. We also had over 300 staff and faculty on site that day supporting the response and supporting um, our clinicians and providing the care as clinicians. And we had over 100 EMS personnel on site for this event. So with that, um, from an emergency management perspective, um, our director had set up a phenomenal framework for managing this with one primary hospital command center being our Pinesis campus and two incident command posts so we could really triangulate essential messaging between the sites. So for this, we had just got the, the Everbridge platform on board. Um, we were still sort of working out the kinks and learning how the system really worked. So we wanted to use this event as an opportunity to beta test the messaging. Um, so we looked at it from an opportunity to send situation status reports to our senior leadership that were not on site for the event so we could con keep them consistently engaged and apprised of efforts as they on were ongoing. So as we sent those SIS stats, um, we learned that the system from an administrative perspective sitting in the command center, as you can see, the top far right corner there, those are our locations, the command center and the command post. 
Um, it was really easy to log into the platform to send those situation status reports to our senior leadership. And we did learn, like everybody responded, um, they really liked having those as text messages um, as opposed to email notifications because you could see quickly where we were at and what a status was. Um, all the way through to when the final patient was moved and when the all clear was given. We received 100% receipt of notifications from that event and we're really pleased with how the system was performing during that beta testing period. Another case study we'd like to speak to that really helped us um, was, you know, it's a few months later, um, we're in summertime of 2015, and, um, you know, we were able to practice more on the system, um, implement the framework, the process framework that we talked about, and get set up um, so that we were really well prepared for if we received an Ebola patient or Ebola suspect patient at all um, and we did. <laughs> so um, in July of 2015, um, with um, notifications and collaboration with our city and county partners, um, we had a suspect patient that presented at one of our UCSF locations, and we activated our Ebola response processes in our Ebola care unit for our organization. Um, with that, Everbridge was the primary platform that we used to send out those notifications. And once again, to reiterate, your communications are only as good as your data. So there was a little bit of a glitch. This was a great case study, a great incident for us because we were actually, at this time, we didn't have the full HR database feed linked up into the system. Um, so we were manually updating contact records. Um, so we were getting those as we received them, but we learned quickly on that that's not a process we wanted to sustain um, because if one person is in charge of mandating, of manually updating and inputting contact records into your Everbridge platform, communications change so quickly you can't keep up. Um, there's always going to be somebody that maybe didn't receive it on a, a text message versus an email, um, and so we wanted to make sure we had a comprehensive framework. So once we really got that um, database feed into our system, we were able to have more sustainability and solid data with our information there and have stronger receipt of notifications when we sent that out. So. In saying that, our event, we were able to activate the appropriate routines um, and we were able to get some good insight in regards to making sure that we wanted to have a solid framework for our HR database fed into the system. Um, and we were able to manage communications through this event with our incident management team in our hospital command center for this event via Everbridge as well. Another great lesson we learned through that was um, Everbridge offers also conference bridges, which are a phenomenal resource. So as you send out a notification to your incident management team, if those folks are still responding in and they want to know sort of what our first incident briefing is and be apprised of the process, they were able to call in. However, we learned quickly on when you send out the notification, some information can be shared, and we quickly got um, almost 100 folks on the line, which was a little bit difficult to manage all those people on the line at one point of time when you're trying to have a scheduled incident briefing. So we established some clear protocols for command and control for how we would manage those incident briefings following. Um, but we were able to see that it worked. The platform worked, the conference bridge line worked, we didn't crash anything, and everybody was notified for the event. So it was a great learning experience. And more recently, <laughs> so um, this was a great business continuity lesson learned. Um, we had our great flood. Uh, this is an event where you know, we opened our new Mission Bay Hospital. It's a gorgeous facility, um, but we have some growing pains in the process, this being one of the primary ones. Um, some of our utilities infrastructure, our piping systems, actually we had a burst in um, our piping infrastructure that was over on our gateway medical building where I mentioned a little bit earlier and we have some of our outpatient clinics and services listed there and some of our ancillary services there. Um, and we had over almost 100,000 gallons of water flood, numerous floors in that building. So we got the notification from our facilities folks at around midnight and they were able to expediently send out notifications to those target groups that respond for this incident. Um, and they did a phenomenal job. We had everything set up and pre-aligned in Everbridge to send those targeted notifications and we got the response team into the hospital command center. 
Our preparations went from midnight till about 7 a.m. through the response to, the, to not the full recovery but the all clear um, when we were able to utilize the platform to send consistent incident briefings and communications to those responders, um, supporting the cleaning um, and supporting the relocation of services to alternate conference rooms um, so we could continue operations when this impacted us. Um, so it was a great opportunity to test those target notifications to our first responder groups as well internally um, as they came in on site and once again to test our incident briefing process as we had some folks on site and some folks virtually managing the response to this event. The fun part, the kicker, was that um, you know we had a great time that evening from midnight to 7 a.m. Luckily we were able to resolve the situation because we have such amazing leadership and such amazing facilities response folks. Um, and we're able to sustain patient care um, that next day starting at 8 a.m. when folks were coming in. But lucky us, we also found out that Monday morning that Joint Commission was on site for our triennial survey. So, <laughs> so now, now our next step was to utilize the Everbridge platform um, under um, you know, our regulatory uh, affairs department uh, to send out the notification to all staff to let them know our Joint Commission surveyors were on site. So, we were able to have a great opportunity to not only test our target notifications for the first responder groups internally for events that impacted us, but also to send it non-emergency alert and to clarify and differentiate the two in our system for those staff to apprise them that Joint Commission was on site and to prepare for that event. So those were some great case studies, some great lessons learned, and with each we always had a number of takeaways that we implemented in our processes. It's always process improvement for us. And one of the critical things to process improvement that every emergency manager knows is exercise integration. Exercises are everything. And I just I have to give kudos to our trainings and exercise manager, Jordan Cathy, who does a phenomenal job um, in light of um, tragic recent events, um, actually prior to the unfortunate events in Orlando um, back in April, he coordinated a coordinated attack exercise. Um, where we were able to test our response with not only our internal UCPD partners, uh, internal um, you know, campus emergency management, and our external partners with EMS and AMR, um, I should say Emergency Medical Services Agency, and our partners with AMR Ambulance Services, to test our response to this type of coordinated attack at our organization. Um, so what that looked like with the scenario was essentially um, an incident occurred within the city and county of San Francisco in downtown. Um, there was a, an attack that created an MCI, um, um, it was a mass casualty incident that had a number of patients um, that would be surging the local hospitals, including UCSF Medical Center, Parnassus. So we had to prepare for an influx of patients. but. The second um, component to that was that we were actually um, planning for response because we just got hit um, with an active shooter incident that was part of that coordinated attack in one of our patient care areas. So with Jordan's leadership and the leadership of security services, they, they um, you know, activated a phenomenal exercise where we were able to test our processes and procedures for how to deal with a coordinated attack that would impact us not only from an external surge perspective, um, making sure we can still treat those patients from the incident, but also internally how to respond with our PD partners if something happens within our doors. With that process for the exercise, we wanted to look at how to streamline it as much as possible. We had this phenomenal new communications platform that is really exceptional at providing targeted notifications, not only to select contact groups, but also by location. So we looked at setting up a group manager's portal in Everbridge. Um, as opposed to just the account administrators. So it gives you your own website, your own platform to have information that you need to see in a very user-friendly interface so you can send and integrate these communications into your emergency management exercises. And I'll explain that. Um, so with Jordan being the master exercise coordinator director for that event, um, we sat down and we looked at all the injects that he wanted for the uh, master scenario events list. That's the measle that drives the exercise. So for those of, of you folks that are not in emergency management, it's sort of um, writing a screenplay. How essentially we wanted the exercise to roll out and what information needed to be communicated to the actors, the players, the participants, and controllers so that they knew what to do for exercise play and facilitation. With that, we took the measles injects and set them up 
as timed scheduled injects in Everbridge. So these were timed notifications that would go out to the different areas in play, be that the command center, the ED, um, the location impacted by the active shooter event with our security leadership, so that it was already set up in the system. They were pre-scheduled for identified times. We could stay on schedule with exercise play. And Jordan would be mobile. So as you can see, that's Jordan over there in the lower right-hand corner hanging out with our, our UCPD folks at their incident command post on scene. Um, because he was able to have those events coordinated, work as a sim cell, um, and enter calls all from his mobile phone because we had the Everbridge platform. So that was a great resource and learning experience there. So as you can see, these are just some of the images of our um, ED surge area that was set up with phenomenal response there. Our hospital command center with some of our um, hospital supervisor leadership and our PIOs there in that other image. And then that's our trainings and exercise manager, Jordan. So just some more images of the exercise where we, um, through, with the help of the Everbridge platform, we're able to streamline communications um, to help us respond to this type of event. And this is just some imagery of what that looks like. So if you're using your mobile phone through the Manage Bridge app, that's free that we were download, he was able to see and double check that every single inject went off as scheduled as we'd set it up in the system according to plan. So with that, those are some of our primary case studies um, and some recent information about, regarding our exercises and how we're utilizing the platform for that. Um, but we'd just like to say for us, we've had the system for a year and a half, and with everything in emergency management, it's all about process improvement. How can we continue to make our programs bigger and stronger um, and make our organization stronger as first receivers when unfortunate events occur? Um, so we have quarterly tests that we set up with our security contacts, our security officers that will send these emergency notifications so that everybody gets consistent practice and hands-on with the tool. Um, and we also learn, we have takeaways as we debrief with every real event activation um, and every exercise so that we can learn how do we improve our process for next time around. And we always look forward to new tools. Um, really love the fact that Everbridge is not a stagnant platform. Um, it doesn't just give you status quo. They go above and beyond to look at new tools and new opportunities to provide these organizations. And for us, looking at their desktop alerting features with Alertus and how we could potentially implement that um, in assessing that with our UCPD and security leadership for desktop alerting for potential active shooter events. And then from an emergency, another emergency management perspective, I should say, um, in how we can automate our disaster call tree process. So we always have our department disaster tree, uh, part, department emergency action plans and in them, we have our disaster call trees on paper, which you always want to have a downtime copy on paper. Um, but if you can, if you have your network resources available, why not streamline the process and have it automated? So have that, get department supervisors and managers to be set up so that they too can send a notification from their mobile phone as necessary to send critical communications to their staff or to their staff at different clinics and off-site locations. So always looking at process improvement. How can we grow? How can we make our program stronger? How can we strengthen communication so that we have sustainable information going out to the parties that are necessary? Because as we all know, in the field of emergency management and in preparation as first receiver hospitals, you know, you're, if your critical emergency communications fail, that really negatively impacts your response capabilities. So we always want to grow those to the best of our ability. So just to recap, to show how we were able to set that up and a lot of lessons learned, it's a step ladder, we're still climbing. A step one for us was once again that leadership support, getting that buy-in um, and making sure our leadership was very knowledgeable and gave us advice on what they would like in seeing those emergency notifications going out. Um, step two, process management, having a really solid foundation, a framework for how we were going to manage our, com our emergency communications for the organization. Step three, a clear messaging strategy. So simple, um, standardized templates with some basic information so staff um, get trained and are knowledgeable on what's coming to them so they um, know exactly what to do when the event occurs. And lastly, testing and utilization, uh, making sure that we always are able to test the system, test, test for any gaps, and make sure that we can have that process improvement if we find any identified issues so we have stronger communications next time around. 
So in that, um, that's all we have. We just wanted to say thank you. We've had the system for about a year and a half, and we've seen that um, it has really helped our emergency communications protocols and procedures um, for UCSF Medical Center. And just wanted to thank you all for your time today. And um, Lisa will give some more information on lessons learned. And if you're interested in learning a little bit more about our active shooter preparedness resources that we have here at UCSF. Marjorie, thank you so much. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, thank you so much to you and Francine for putting that together. Um, I did want to address one concern that was coming up in our, our questions and comments section. And that was over um, texting and uh, getting messages through. And the one thing that I did want to mention is that Everbridge is SOC 2, SOC 3, and then we also have a special special designation with the FCC so that if you're on any of our apps, if you're on Secure Bridge or um, Manage Bridge or HIPAA Bridge, that any of those texts are prioritized over civilian texts. Um, so it's sort of the White House first, the military second, and then we're in the third tier, we're even with FEMA. So, um, so if your hospital is facing a real crisis and you're really concerned about messaging getting through, um, using our apps over using straight text messaging is going to give you um, a higher quality return. And with that, I'm going to switch it over to Eric. Um, he is our general manager for healthcare, and he's going to go over just a couple of points. All right, thank you, Lisa, and, and thank you, Francine and Marjorie, too, for a great presentation. And I think um, what you heard today really does tie into um, not only what we're doing with the Everbridge platform, but essentially with um, some of the challenges that I think many of you are facing on the call today, um, as well as many of our customers. And so I just wanted to share a couple of quick points that we hear in general and customer feedback as you think through how to address these challenges. Um, I think. Picking up on the last scenario, which obviously, um, you know, in, in recent events is very um, forefront of mind around having an active shooter event, um, but a lot of the things that you're going to see here really do tie out to multiple areas in responding to um, various emergencies that might happen across the healthcare system. And so, you know, in thinking about that, really thinking about who are your communication channels, and I think this was covered um, a bit in the presentation, but you know, one of the things we often talk about with many of our customers is, you know, who's going to respond to the emergency, who's going to uh, take care of that um, emergency situation, how do you communicate with them, um, you know, how do you protect your impacted constituents. I think um, many of you probably know uh, very well um, that's very different in, in healthcare than it is in a lot of other settings where emergencies might happen, including considering how patients and visitors might be protected in an emergency scenario. And then I think, you know, really the incident briefings that uh, Marjorie really highlighted, which is, you know, how do we keep our uh, executives and sort of our stakeholders informed throughout the process? Um, and, and so our, this sort of simple framework that uh, we often speak to here is, you know, the what are we, obviously, what are we alerting around? And then, you know, who needs to know? So who are your target audiences in each of those areas? Um, including things and some of the capabilities of, Many times you may not even know who those right responders are, right? It may be shift-based folks or folks that you want to reach out. Um, for example, if you want to pull in um, extra staff for a crisis situation, particularly clinical staff, trying to figure out who those folks are and uh, who are who's on, who's off, um, on call rather. Um, also understanding, um, obviously keeping staff and leadership involved, but also thinking about those patients and visitors who really, you know, may not be part of your um, you know, your current IT systems, but still could be in one of your centers as an incident occurs. Um, and then I think Marjorie and, and, and um, Francine really both talked to multiple ways of communicating and thinking about those different modalities of reaching folks. Um, we, we work with a number of those different ones. Um, Lisa was commenting a little bit about texting, et cetera, but really having many, many modes for communicating with folks is really key in any of these situations because anyone could be active at a time. And then just talking about collaboration, we, everything from uh, conferencing uh, to escalation. So, you know, one of the things that we work on very heavily is, you know, what if that first person doesn't respond, how do you escalate to the next person? All that's um, capabilities that we partner up with customers on to resolving, um, as well as things such as polling and et cetera. So just a couple of things, just to kind of give you kind of directionally um, where Everbridge is, is evolving our platform to really address these situations. You know, I think 
you know, talk, we talked a little bit about filling out templates and planning, 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 right, ahead of time. We're, we're doing a lot of work right now to really make those templates as easy to activate as possible and really preset those communications so that in a crisis situation, particularly as, you know, and unfortunately active shooter is one of those scenarios where, you know, the timing is very, very short. And so, you know, as those timings become less and less, become shorter and shorter for teams to respond to, the quicker you can respond to those, the better. And so we're doing a lot of work around, you know, essentially one button kind of push notifications where you can send out uh, multiple messages to all your different teams at once or set up a schedule like Marjorie highlighted in their scenario. So just different ways to basically pre-plan and set up those communication paths. Another area where we're spending um, another area where we're spending quite a bit of time is really uh, basically thinking about safety uh, safety of folks, right? So um, not only communication and notification, but how can location information really help you better prepare and better uh, connect with folks? So you know one of the capabilities that we work on we recently uh, made available is to basically take an event, say say a wildfire kind of event, and take a fire map and overlay that to an area to figure out who the affected individuals might be from an employee perspective, from a, cl from a clinical perspective, and who might need to evacuate, et cetera. So that, that capability along with being able to enhance that and do things such as muster roles and really being able to understand who is in the building right at the moment based on the last time that they badged in or, you know, based on their cell phone or based on registration fees, those kinds of things, so that we can really uh, make sure we're mustering everybody in the case of an incident. So these are just some of the things that we're working on. Um, and, and, you know, in addition to UCSF, obviously we work with a number of healthcare organizations across the country on these techniques. And so we continue to evolve, um, which I think uh, UCSF, F is actually one of our partners in that area. I think they mentioned a little bit some of the other things that they're trying to employ as they move forward to really enhance their capabilities. And we continue to strive there. And, you know, for those of you on the phone who uh, certainly are customers and et cetera, we're, we're always trying to listen and partner up with customers um, and folks in the industry to try and really have, have our technology and services really uh, better prepare uh, and enable your healthcare organizations uh, to prepare for emergencies. And so with that, I'll, I'll, we'll take that and turn it over to some questions. Thank you so much, Eric. Really appreciate your input. This is Lisa Johnson again, and we have a couple of questions before we go. Uh, Francine and Marjorie, are you guys still there? Still here. Okay. Let's get to our first question. Did you encounter any issues with communicating to employees' personal mobile devices and the California state labor regulations that require employers to compensate employees for use of personal devices for work-related communications? Right, that's a great question, thank you. And as Francine mentioned earlier on, um, per our Labor and Employee Relations Department, we do not solicit or mandate um, employee personal contact information for our notification system. So with that in mind, we do have their employee contact information in our system. So if it's a work-issued cell phone, um, if it's a work-issued email address, clearly, and a number of other modalities, that data is in our system. They may elect, which we've put in our marketing and information materials, they may elect to input their personal information, such as a personal cell phone, a personal email address, or personal home phone, into our system via the mobile member app. Um, however, we don't mandate that. So let's wrap up. And again, thank you, Marjorie and Francine, for such a great session. And to all of our attendees for coming and participating in the polls and asking your questions to today. If you missed any part of the webinar, we will be sending out an email with the recording in a few days. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to follow us on Twitter at Everbridge. You can also check out everbridge.com for more information on critical communications. Thank you all again for your participation in today's webinar. We hope to see you soon.